Hello folks, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. Church about 15 minutes from here, in fact. And I come here to the rest area throughout the week to preach the gospel of grace, to bring to you the good news of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, I'm here to, to warn you about your sin before God, to warn you about the wrath of God which is to come. And to warn you that if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is only an expectation of God's judgment upon you for all eternity. But I'm here to say that God, being rich in mercy, has sent forth His Son as the Savior. And He is the ark of salvation, and those who put their trust in Him will be saved from their sin. They will be, they will be born from above. For Jesus said Himself in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Dear friends, in Jesus' first coming, He came to save sinners. He came to save sinners by laying down His own life as a ransom for many at that cross. And then He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And He is to soon return. In fact, uh, every moment is simply a, a counting down to that day in which He will return. And when He returns, it will not be to save from sin, but to punish it and to punish the evildoer. And so there's an urgency in the message. There's an urgency in the preaching. Because your soul, my friends, is at stake. And I want you to be at peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I care for your souls, friends. I wouldn't come out here if I didn't. There's many things that I could be doing with my afternoon, but friends, I, I care for you. And I believe the truth of Scripture. I believe what the Bible has to say concerning these things. And so I must warn you, flee, flee the wrath which is to come. Now the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. The name of Jesus Christ is the only name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. As the book of Acts tells us, there's only one name by which you can be saved and it's the name of Jesus Christ. Even His name declares His mission. His name means Yahweh saves, God saves. Even His name declares His office and His work. And dear friends, I call out to you to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To give God the glory for the great things He has done in His Son. To not trample the blood of the Lamb of God underfoot. For there is, there is a special place in hell for those who hear the message of the cross and reject it. It's one thing to have never known about the Lord Jesus Christ and then to go to hell, but it's a whole nother to know the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense that you know the message of the Gospel and you've heard it preached to you or you've grown up in church or perhaps you're involved in church, and to not genuinely be saved yourself, to not have a, a genuine right standing before God. Dear friends, I'm out here even for the church folk among you. Even you who perhaps are deacons or elders in local churches, because you yourselves might be unconverted. Jesus said Himself in Matthew 7 that there are many on the day of judgment who will say to Him, Lord, Lord, and He says, I will say to those people, depart from Me, you who practice lawlessness, for I never knew you. Friends, there is a, a certain category, a, a certain type of person who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ, who claims to be a, a born-again child of God, and they were a hypocrite their whole life. And they'll be turned away on the day of judgment. Friends, I don't want that for you. Certainly not. I don't want you to be self-deluded, self-deceived. It's one thing to be deceived and you know it. It's another to be self-deceived and self-deluded. And so friends, my cry to you today is to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved as Acts 16.31 tells us. And friends, chiefly above that, I'm here to bring, you, I'm here to, to bring God glory and to bring you the glorious message of the Gospel. And therein to bring God glory. For that is the chief end of all things. God is working everything to the end that He Himself might be glorified. Ephesians 1.11 tells us that He works all things after the counsel of His will. God bless you, ma'am. 
God is jealous for His own glory and His own praise and His own adoration. And so He has so designed the economy of salvation to be that it is all of grace, it is 100% of the work of Jesus Christ, so God gets 100% of the glory. And so the text of Scripture I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon, the text that I would like to put my emphasis and focus on in these moments, these beginning moments at least, is in Romans chapter 1. It's been a joy to go through Romans 1 in the open air. I've been able to preach a, a quite a, a good amount of passages out of this chapter here at this particular spot. And so friends, verse 22 the Apostle Paul writes these words, and he is speaking of those who reject Christ and those who are or the enemies of God. This is what he says in verse 22. He says, Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Dear friends, you were created in the image of God. And friends, you have something that is unique within you that God has not endowed upon any of His other creatures. And that is what we call the seed of religion. In other words, you're created to worship. You are made to worship. In fact, originally man's designed by God. In the, in the book of Genesis, we read that, that God had designed man to commune with Him, to enjoy His presence, and to glorify Him. That was God's original intent. But what happened was, we find in the book of Genesis in chapter 3, that the serpent deceived Eve, and she ate the apple that was forbidden by God. And she ate the fruit that had been forbidden for her to eat. And she therefore deceived not only herself, but brought her husband into it. And, and Adam sinned. And we know from the uniform testimony of Scripture that that was when man fell. The first man, Adam, represented us in that garden. He, he was the federal head. He was the representative of mankind as a whole. You know, friends, our, our nation's president whoever it may be, and whether you like them or not, they are the federal head of our nation. For eight years, we had a man by the name of Barack Obama who was our federal head. He represented our nation on the international stage. And he conducted treaties and other things like that, business meetings. And he was representing the whole nation all of the, of the 300 million plus people who live in the United States. And Adam, the first man, was also likewise a federal head. He was a, represented, a representative. And he represented us in that garden and he fell. He could not keep the covenant of works. And so what happened from then on, and this is the state of every person who's ever existed, they're fallen. They have fallen into sin. In fact, listen to uh, two chapters later, Paul writes in chapter 3, he says in verse 23, for all, that is without distinction, that is everyone, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is falling short of the glory of God. And dear friends, we've all done that. We are born, and the psalmist says in Psalm 51, we are conceived in sin. In fact, it's very rare you're going to find someone who would actually claim to be a perfect person. Very rare. People are, are they know that they are imperfect. And we could talk about how just admitting you're imperfect doesn't mean much of anything. But dear friends, no one, hardly anyone at least, would claim to be perfect. That's a testimony to the fact that we have fallen. People know that they have fallen. But it's not just that we've missed it a little bit. We have totally, absolutely, and completely fallen short of the glory of God. 
Man is depraved. Man is dead in sin. Ephesians 2.1 says that sinners outside of Christ are dead. They're spiritually unable to listen to truth. Spiritually unable to react to the truth of God. It's not just that people are sick in sin. They, are, they have already been killed by it. And they're simply walking around in a physical body, but their soul is dead. And that is why salvation is a miraculous gift of God, whereby He raises a dead sinner from the dead. He calls forth into the tomb of the darkened heart of a sinner and says, come forth. God, my friends, is in the business of raising people from the dead. And praise be to Him for that. that He has the ability to raise the dead. And that's what it takes to save a wretched sinner. So my friends, because of our fallenness, because of our fallen nature before God, we therefore just continue to do sin day after day after day and live in sin and drink down iniquity like water as the, the Scripture reads. We swim in the sewage of iniquity. But friends, as I said a moment ago, that, that inclination to worship is still within us. So what we will do is we will certainly not worship God because of our fallenness. You certainly do not worship God if you're outside of Christ. But instead what you worship is a whole plethora of things. Things which the Bible say are idols. False gods. Whether that be your money. Whether that be your success. Whether that be your career. Whether that be pleasure. Whether that be food. Or perhaps another God who's not a God at all. It's just an idol, a made-up figment of someone's imagination. Man is designed to worship, but because of sin, he does not, he cannot, and he will not worship God. He worships other things, worships his sin, he worships the world. He worships demonic influence. This is because of the fallen nature of man. And so that's the issue I want to look at and cover in these two verses is idolatry. Is idolatry. If you are outside the, the, of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, friends, then you're an idol worshiper. And that's a, that's a horrible place to be in. To be an idol worshiper is to be a, an, an enemy of God, is to be against the Lord God. To be someone who makes idols and who worships other things, the creature, the creation, rather than the Creator, is to greatly offend God, greatly offend Him. One of the first commands that God gives one of the chiefest and most important commands that God gives. In Exodus 20, God says, in verse 2, He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And in the context, that is to the Israelites whom God rescued out of Egypt. But listen to this morally binding law that's still in action and in effect today. This is verse 3. He says, You shall have no other gods before Me. Even the one who claims that he or she does not believe in God or does not believe in the existence of, a, of any higher power, they themselves still have the seed of religion in them and they must worship. But as I said a moment ago, it is not the God of Scripture. And it may not even be a, a blatantly clear God. That, uh, like they say that they're religious. But it can be any plethora of things. It can really be anything. Dear friends, you can even worship the God of your own intellect. You can worship anything. But they all bring the same in. They all bring the same punishment. And I do not want you to have to take upon yourself that punishment. For you cannot bear it. 
Hell is eternal. Hell is real. Jesus spoke more about it than He did heaven because He, he wanted to warn people. He wanted to warn sinners about the impending judgment. And friends, in, the, in following in the footsteps of my Lord, I want to warn you as well. I want to warn you to flee. For Jesus described hell as the eternal flame. And I do not want you to burn into, in the eternal flame. But before we specifically look at these two verses, I want to briefly consider our context. We understand where the Apostle Paul is coming from. He, in chapter 1, has explained in verses 16 and 17 what he is going to spend the rest of the book unpacking. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then in verse 17, he further enumerates on that. He further lists out what the gospel is. He says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Friends, I, I want you to believe the promises of God, to believe that God is able to save you from your sins and to receive the gift of righteousness and eternal life that was purchased through the work of Jesus Christ. Be saved from this perverse and wicked generation, dear friends. And so Paul wants to explain the Gospel as he says in verse 16. And the Greek word he uses there is euangelion. It means good tidings, good news. And the Gospel is good news. But to understand the good news of the Gospel, one must grasp, in order to understand the grace, love, mercy, and kindness of God as they are revealed in Jesus Christ, you must understand the weightiness of His holiness and His righteousness. You must understand how horrible your sin is. One can only grasp the greatness of God's grace if they first see the, the abundance of their iniquities that are before His eyes. The less you understand your sin and the weightiness and the, the utter horror of your depravity, the less you will appreciate the grace of God. And so Paul wants to first explain the bad news before he gives the good news. He wants to preface the Gospel by bringing the bad tidings. And so he begins in verse 18 with these words, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And so then he continues to explain in those, in those ensuing verses that God's wrath is revealed from heaven. His hatred against sin and the sinner is poured out. And he talks about in these verses the marks of someone who has rejected the God who created them. And so in verse 22 is where we find ourselves. In fact, I'll just go back to verse 21 so we really understand what he just says, what he, what he had just said. He says in verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, nor give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so, they, they reject the God of Scripture and so their, their heart, heart is just hardened further and there's, there's more darkness that is added. And that brings us to verse 22 where the text reads, professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's what I want us to look at. And in verse 23 as well, the idolatry of man. The idolatry of sinful man. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Friends, how many people do we see these days claiming to have knowledge concerning very important things? Whether it be a plethora of science degrees or a plethora of, deg of degrees and understanding of medical, of medical things. Or people that say they have a great understanding of politics. 
or people that they say they have an understanding of whatever topic, you can fill in the blank. They profess their own wisdom. And yet, they're actually fools if they're outside of Christ. They're actually, they're actually intellectually depraved if they reject Christ. To reject the God of Scripture is to commit intellectual suicide. To reject the God who made you is ridiculous. It is, it is an absurdity. And that is why you could be brilliant in whatever subject you'd like, whatever subject you, you could bring up. But friends, if you're not knowledgeable in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't know Him in a saving manner, then you yourself, dear friends, are a fool. As the text reads, professing to be wise, they became fools. Notice also the text reads that they professed it. That is, that they had a, a thin veneer on the outside. It was something that they could project upon others. They could, they could make it look like they were brilliant. In fact, I love to study many different things. I have a lot of subjects that intrigue my mind. Things like astronomy. And there are things that just are so interesting to me, but my, my friends, what's most important is, the, is knowing the good news, is knowing the gospel salvation. For apart from the gospel, as the, the great reformer John Calvin said, everything is, is useless and it is vain. Everything in this world is useless and vain apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the centerpiece of history. It is everything. And if you have Christ, you have all you will ever need and more. But if you do not have Christ, you have nothing. You have nothing. It doesn't matter how wealthy, how smart, how prestigious you are. And it's all going to come to an end. Your body, you're going to die and your body's going to be eaten by worms. But my friends, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving fashion and you have come to grasp what Christ has done at Calvary, then you yourself have all that you will ever need. Professing to be wise, they became fools. There is also a sense in which, as the Bible says, when someone finds themselves in a state in which they are constantly rejecting the God of Scripture and they are constantly rejecting the Gospel of Jesus Christ, there is more foolishness and more hardness of heart that is added onto them. There is a, a time in which God will give people up unto the sin which they so love. Jesus Himself said in John 6, 44, that no one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. How come the Scriptures say that no one can come to Christ unless God first works on their heart? That is because they will not come to Christ. They cannot because they will not. They desire not the things of God and not the good news. They care not of those things. They love their sin. And so they cannot come to Christ because they will not. And that is why verse 26 reads, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. God gave them over to their degrading passions. There is a, as I said a moment ago, a sense in which Scripture speaks to the fact that if you turn from the Gospel message, God will give you up. God will give you up to your sins, friends. Do not reject Christ. Do not continue to reject Christ. Do not harden your heart, friends. Be soft and tender-hearted and consider the Word of the Lord. Consider the, uh, the teaching of Scripture, the authoritative Word of God, the, the inspired and infallible and inerrant Word of the living God. Consider what it has to say concerning you and your soul and your sin and the work of Christ that He died as a, as a propitiatory sacrifice 
and that He was raised on the third day by the Father's power and He's exalted in glory. And all who believe on Him will be saved from their sins and they will be wrapped in His very righteousness. Consider the Gospel and believe the Gospel. Professing to be wise, they became fools, as the text reads. So God gives them over to a foolish mind. And what do we see today happening in our culture? Culture, That exact thing. We as a nation corporately have turned away from the Lord God. In fact, we, we really were never there in the fullest sense. But at least in, in previous generations, there was a reverence and a respect for the truth of Scripture, for the authority of the Word of God, for Christian value. But there is no such thing anymore in this nation. And therefore, corporately, having rejected the Lord God of hosts to the uttermost and anything that resembles the truth of Scripture, as a nation, we find ourselves degrading. We find ourselves falling into further and further depravity. Greater and greater sin do we see ourselves as a nation in. Divorce rates, crime rates, you name it, they're up. We can't even trust whether there's going to be a male or female in the bathroom when we walk in there. All this ridiculous gender confusion. There's so much sin and so much rejection of the not only even the truth of Scripture, but just the creative order. Just, just general common sense has been lost. Why? Because God, when people reject Him and turn from His truth and harden their hearts, God will give them up to it. As the text read, reads, professing to be wise, they became fools. But we could look at this in the positive because that's the negative. So if you receive the Lord God, you receive the Gospel message with much gratitude, then where do you find yourself? You find yourself being wise. If you fear the Lord God of hosts and you fear the Creator and His, judge, and His judgments, then you find yourself in wisdom. As Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 reads, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Dear friends, if you want to have true knowledge, saving knowledge, fear the Lord God. Fear His holiness. It is a, a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, as the New Testament says. For God is, is holy and righteous and a, and a just judge. And He hates sin. He hates the sinner. Psalm 5 and Psalm 11 tells us that. His hatred is upon you if you're outside of Christ. But God will relent if you repent and believe. God will pour out the, the riches of His kindness and His love upon you and bring you into heaven, bring you into glory through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Romans 5 tells us in verse 8, but God, excuse me, um, yeah, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ is the revelation of God's love for sinners. Now let us move on to verse 23 of Romans chapter 1. Paul continues with these words. He says, And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Notice the first phrase he employs there in verse 23. It says, And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God. Dear friends, God is imminent. God is near to every one of us. He is not far. Even to the most wicked and vile among you, God is near to you. 
God is all places. He is omnipresent. And as the book of, uh, of Joel tells us, as well as the book of Acts, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How can such a text be fulfilled? Because God is imminent. God is near. Call upon Him and be saved from your sins. Be saved from eternal damnation. And so God's presence, God's salvation, God's grace and mercy, God's compassion upon you is near. And that is why verse 23 says they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God because it is something which is at their fingertips, something which they can grab hold of at any moment. But instead, what do sinners do? What do people who are dead in sin do? Instead of grabbing hold of that which is so near to them and so close to them, they turn from the God of Scripture, they turn from the God of glory, and they reject the Gospel message. And instead, as the text reads, they exchange God's glorious presence, God's glorious grace for something else. And it is idol worship is what it is. As the text reads, they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Paul uses multiple terms here to encompass all of the, of the different idols that people have whether it be their own selves, as it says, the image of corruptible man, or perhaps they worship a celebrity, or a movie star, or a musical artist. And birds, and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. He's trying to be all-inclusive here. For this includes, this sweeping condemnation of idolatry includes all sorts of idols, all kinds of idols which people worship. Many false gods are there in the world, but there is only one true God, and that is the God of glory. There is only one Creator God. There's only one. There's not multiple, there's not two or three gods. There's one God, and His name is Yahweh. He is the God of the Bible. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is what is called the Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one God. And He's the God of glory. The God of all grace. The Father of mercies. And He has sent forth His Son to save sinners. Sinners as bad as yourselves, as bad as myself, who cannot help themselves. Christ is for those who tried to help themselves and they saw that they could not do a thing. And they are failures. And they're wretches. Jesus is not a self-help program. The Gospel is not something that you add on to your life on top of what you're already doing. It is a, a radical, life-changing truth. It is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And so friends, in light of this text, I want to challenge you. What do you worship? I'm not asking, do you worship? Or how often do you worship? For I know that you are in a state constantly in worship of something. And there's only two categories. You're either worshiping the true and living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, or you are in the other category. That is, you're worshiping an idol, a false God, and whatever that God might be. And so, folks, I cry out to you, and I challenge you to look at yourself and see your idolatry, which God condemns in the book of Exodus. God condemns it and it deserves hellfire. But God has prepared 
the ark of salvation. It's Christ His Son. The Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Him and live. Or perhaps you, you who are Christians even out here, I challenge you. Do you need to repent of idolatry? Have you found yourself worshipping other things rather than the God who saved you from your sins? Repent. Be zealous, therefore. And return unto your first love. For God is jealous for His people. He is jealous for His people to be holy and to be righteous and pure. If you're a Christian, I want to tell you that God is jealous for your holiness, for your consecration. And therefore, be zealous and repent. And be jealous for Him. Be jealous for His glory. And so truly we ask ourselves, at a text like this, that is so sweeping in its condemnation of sin, we find ourselves asking, but what makes sin, sin? In other words, why is idolatry wrong? Why is sin wrong? Why does God condemn certain actions? Well, to answer simply, and I will unpack this in these ensuing moments, Lord willing. Sin is that which is contrary to the character and person of God. My friend, sin is sin because it is in contradiction to the God of glory. That's why it is sin. See, God is not like we think Him to be. God is a, a holy and just God and a righteous God. In fact, the, the most terrifying, the most horror-inducing truth of the Bible is that God is a good God. It is because God is so good and so righteous, He must punish the guilty. That's a cause of great fear for the wicked. God is gracious and compassionate. God is abounding in loving kindness. We see that every day. In fact, right now that breeze feels so good standing out here in the warm weather. And that is, that is a testimony to God's loving kindness and His grace. But these attributes of God, these glorious and precious attributes, never negate His other attributes. No, His attributes all stand alongside one another in perfect unity. God is not self-contradicting. He is absolutely unified in His attributes. In His perfect being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in three and three in one. God is all places and He is everywhere. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is immutable. He is never changing. Never will He change. He is the eternal God. He is the wrathful God and He is also a God of hatred. He has hatred for the wicked. Hatred for sin. Hatred for that which is in contradiction to His perfect character. And so that is where we find ourselves looking at the law. Because what the law is, the law of God is a, is a display of God's righteous character. God's law is a display of His perfect character. His moral perfection. For we find ourselves looking at the command, you shall not lie. That is because God is not a liar. The Bible tells us God cannot lie. It is an impossibility for God to bear false witness. Why does God say you shall not steal? For He Himself is not a thief. God says you shall not commit adultery. You shall not fornicate. Why? Because God is a faithful God. He never fails in being faithful to His people. He never fails in causing His promises to come to pass. I could go on and on. My friends, God's law is a reflection of His moral perfection. And it is also a reflection of the depravity of man. As I've already spoken on, we have, fall, we have totally fallen short of the glory of God we find ourselves looking at these commands and we see our imperfection. We see that we have lied, as God said we ought not to do. We see that we have stolen, as God has, for, has forbidden. We see that ourselves, many of us find ourselves having committed the sin of adultery. But many of you will be quick to say, well, I've never done that thing. I've never committed adultery. Well, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5.
He says in verse 27, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Dear friends, God sees your mind. He sees the thoughts. He sees the intent of your heart. And He sees that it's evil and it's wicked and it's perverse. He sees that you're a God-hater. There's no neutrality with Jesus Christ. You either love God and you are in obedience and in submission to His will, or you are in rebellion to God and you hate God and you are His enemy. There's no neutrality. Jesus said you are either for me or you are against me. Young man, there's no neutrality with the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely no neutrality. You must be born from above. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, even a young man, he must, uh, excuse, uh, unless a man is born again, he cannot see God's kingdom. You've got to be saved by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. See, my friends, the law, God's law, is perfect and we cannot keep it. That's the point of the Ten Commandments. You've probably heard of the Ten Commandments. The point is to show us we can't keep them. It's not to be a good person because you can't be a good person. And so because of your breaking the law, and your breaking the law, my breaking the law, we deserve hell. We deserve God's punishment for sin. We deserve to go to the place that Jesus said is an eternal flame, an eternal fire. But Scripture says God being rich in mercy, He loves sinners, that He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He died on that cross and satisfied God's wrath against sin. And He was raised on the third day, and you must repent and believe that. You must believe the gospel. Put your trust in the work of Christ. See, you're either right now, you're either trusting yourself or you're trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior. You're either trusting your own religious performance or you're trusting in the work of Christ. There's no middle ground. So look to Christ. The Bible says, look to me all the ends of the earth and be saved. Friends, the wrath of God is coming soon. Have you been born again, sir? You've got to be saved from your sin. And I don't mean, I don't mean well, you just say you're a Christian, you just have an outward veneer of religious performance. Or you've perhaps had a, 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 an emotional experience in a church. I'm talking about have you been changed? Has your life been changed? Has God done a work in your heart? It's not about just saying you're a Christian. In fact, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter 7. In verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith, whether you have Jesus Christ in you. It's about the fruit of your life, the fruit of your actions. For Jesus said in that same chapter in verse 20, you will know them by their fruits. And it said, it said the same thing in verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Oh, dear friends, don't lose your soul for your sin. Don't lose your soul. Don't live your life living for yourself or your spouse or whatever you might be living for. Live for the glory of God. Live to the end that God might be glorified in you. But going back to what I was saying, friends, the law, we cannot keep it. We cannot keep that law. And so we find ourselves having fallen short of the glory of God, as that, as that text I read earlier says. That's, that is what is meant by that phrase, fall short of the glory of God. We have missed the mark. We have missed the standard. And just as a convicted murderer here in South, South Carolina must be punished for having committed that horrible crime, perhaps even put on death row, so too must a sinner who has rejected the God of Scripture and has rebelled against Him and has broken His law must be punished by death. And not a physical death, for we all die. Even the righteous die. But it is a spiritual, eternal death. It is being placed in the place that Jesus said is the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is being thrown into the, the lake which burns. 
fire and brimstone for all eternity. It is being punished under the full fury of God's wrath. And so we are without hope. We are without any hope because our good deeds cannot merit a right standing before God. We are condemned to hell and nothing can get us out of that. It's like a, it's like a convicted murderer here in South Carolina saying to the judge, well, judge, you know, I've, I know that I've murdered, but I haven't, I, I stopped murdering a few months ago. I've been giving to charity. I, I gave blood at the blood drive, and therefore I've done some good deeds, and it's just going to outweigh my bad. It doesn't work like that. God is holy, 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 and He is righteous, and God must punish the wicked. And so we are without any hope, simply awaiting the final day of punishment. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41 concerning the day of judgment when He will punish the wicked. He will say these words, verse 41, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Friends, I don't want you to go there. I love you and care for you. I would not want you to go to this place and so that leads me to say these words, that God, being rich in mercy, with so great a love with which He has loved His elect people, He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, came down to earth and took upon Himself flesh and dwelt among men. Every other religion in the world says work your way up to God. But the religion of Scripture says God has condescended and come down to man and has done the work that man could never do for himself. Christ comes and He heals and He teaches. He even raises people from the dead. He displays His power and His glory. He says in Matthew 5.17, I came to fulfill the law. Christ came to fulfill those commands that we find ourselves having broken. He, he loved the Lord his God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength every moment of every day. And he loved his neighbor as himself. And he never lied. He never stole anything. He never committed adultery. He was never an idolater. My friends, Jesus Christ lived the absolute perfect life on behalf of sinners. And then He goes and He lays Himself down to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. And He is whipped. And He is beat. And He is mocked. He is betrayed even by His own disciples. They forsake even Him. And He, he goes and He is nailed to this cross. And He's hanging there as the, the Lamb of God, the centerpiece of all history. And He is hanging there on that cross. And He cries out in those, in those hours of suffering and in that agony, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, God unleashed upon His Son the full fury of His wrath. As it says in Isaiah 53.10, it pleased the Lord to crush him. In Isaiah 53.5, that same chapter, just five verses back, it says, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. My friends, Christ at the cross underwent the full, eternal wrath of God against sin. He paid the infinite price that no one could ever pay for themselves. And then, after He died on that cross, after three days in the tomb, praise be to God that He rose from the grave and He is alive today. Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life. By His own power, He rose Himself up from the grave. As Romans 4.25 says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. He was raised from the dead. And the book of Hebrews says He will never die again. Never to die again. Never to be killed again. 
For He has put away sin. He has done the work of, of salvation already. It's complete. It's done. It's finished. Away with this blasphemous Roman Catholic trash that says He is re-crucified at the Mass. That's a lie to the pit of hell. Christ's work is done. As He said at the cross in those final moments, He cried out to tell us die. That is, it is finished. Paid for in full. Done. And after He rose from the grave, He continued to minister among His disciples to teach. And then after 40 days of further ministry, He ex He entered into heaven. He bodily ascended into celestial glory and He is in heaven today. He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty on high. And He reigns as King, as God of glory. He reigns as the Lord who, who is sovereign over your life. You are in His hand. He is controlling every event in the universe he is the sovereign Lord and He reigns. Our God reigns. And so you ask, and the question arises in the heart of man, what must I do to be saved? If Christ has done the work of salvation, what is there left for me to do? Nothing but to believe that He did it. That's the word of the Gospel. Believe it. We go all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 15.6 God gives Abraham a promise. A promise that he is going to be a, a father in his old age. And what does the text say? In chapter 15 verse 6 it says, Then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. He believed the promise of God. Friends, believe that what God has said is true that Jesus truly came and lived and died and rose again to save His people, His bride, His elect from their sins. Believe that. Flee your sin. Jesus said in Matthew, or excuse me, in Mark 1.15, He said, repent and believe the Gospel. Repent. Turn from your rebellion. Turn from your idolatry. Turn from your pornography. Turn from your drunkenness and your drug abuse. Your love for filthy language. Your hypocrisy. Turn from it. My friends, God sees your internet browsing history. Something your wife or your girlfriend might not be able to see. God sees it. You may hit the delete button, but God remembers it. And if you're not in Christ, it will be punished on yourself. You will have to bear the punishment for that. But if you are in Christ, then you know your sins have been forgiven. Dear friends, repent and believe the Word of the Gospel. It is a promise. If someone here on earth makes you a promise, you're, especially if you trust Him, you're more than likely to believe them and to take them at their Word. How much more God who cannot lie. How much more the Creator who has simply said, Believe upon My Son and be saved. Romans 4.5 But to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. My friends, the religion of Scripture is not this self-help system. This, you do 10%, Jesus will do 90. Or you do 50, Jesus will do 50. It is all 100% of God so that God gets the glory. God is jealous to bring glory to His own name. Away with this notion of works righteousness. Away with these lies out of the pit of hell that say you have to offer up some amount of righteousness of your own to be saved. Because I don't know about you, but I have no righteousness to offer to God. I have not an ounce of perfection to give to Him. And if you think so, you're deluded. You're so self-deluded. If you think you have any goodness to offer up to God, if you have any amount of religiosity that will persuade Him to forgive you, God will not be bribed. The only one who ever pleased God was the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in Matthew 3, we see when Jesus is baptized, there's an audible voice from heaven. And it's the voice of the Father. And He says, This is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Who can, who can, who can seriously say, God could say that about me? God could say that about my religious performance. 
Oh, dear friends, what a, what a horrible state to be in if you think that about yourself. Believe upon Christ. Forsake self-righteousness. Jesus' most strong and most harsh words were always for those who thought that they could make themselves right with God by their religiosity. Jesus always had the most harshest of words for those who said, you know what, we're pretty good. We're trying our best. We're keeping the law. But Jesus had the most gracious words for those who were humble and contrite of spirit and who trembled at the Word of God and believed the message of the Gospel. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 11, Come to Me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. No righteousness will do. No amount of good works will do before God. You must have the perfect righteousness of Christ. Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. All of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind take us away. But my friends, I give you this, this precious promise. If you believe the gospel, then your sin will all be forgiven. As a whole, it'll be, it'll be washed away. You'll, you'll be forgiven of your sin because of the atoning work of Christ at the cross. You'll be forgiven and you'll never once have to bear your guilt before God because Christ took it already. And then my friends, not only that, but God will credit you with having lived Jesus' perfect life. God will credit you with having fulfilled the law. God will credit you with having done all of the things that Jesus did so that He can say about you, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. It is about whether you want your own righteousness or the righteousness of Christ and your righteousness is not sufficient because it is no righteousness of all, at all. My friends, believe the gospel, forgiveness, imputed righteousness. You'll be wrapped in His very righteousness. This is glorious. And that is the good news of the Gospel. Believe it, dear friends. Believe it with all your heart. And be saved. I want to, in these closing moments, make mention of something that I would like to challenge you who are out here who claim to be Christians concerning. Those of you who say you're Christians, I want to challenge you with something. Jesus told us in Matthew 7, verses 16 and 20, that you will know them by their fruits. You will know someone's faith, the validity of someone's faith by their fruit. In other words, by their life, by their actions. And let me ask you, if you claim to be a Christian, do you live in according to what Jesus said? It is not that you live that way so that you might be saved. It is not you try to have a religious performance before God so that you can be saved. You live religiously and you live a pious life because you know that you have been saved. It is out of gratitude, not a sense of, well, I have to do this in order to be saved. My friends, you who claim to be Christians, examine yourself. Look at the fruit of your life. Look at your thoughts. Look at your words. Look at your speech. Do you live in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you live in, in obedience and submission to the will of God? That is the evidence of a genuine Christian. I was a false convert for eight years, a false Christian for eight years, and I lived in blatant rebellion, blatant sin, all the while thinking I was a Christian because I said I was a Christian. And I believed, right? Quote and unquote. No, I didn't truly believe. I was a hypocrite. I was a hypocrite, my friends. My friends, if you claim to be a Christian, you're claiming to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you walk in disobedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't love Him. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about a direction of your life. A true Christian knows that they sin. They know that they fall short. 
I'm not saying if you're a genuine Christian, you're going to be perfect. I'm saying, where is your life pointing? What, is, what direction are you moving in? When I was a false convert, when I was a false Christian, I was just moving in the direction of more and more and more sin, and I cared nothing of holiness, nothing about prayer, nothing about reading the Word, nothing about sharing the Gospel with other people. It was blatant hypocrisy. It was a thin veneer of, of Christianity on the outside to cover up the deadness which I had in the inside. And friends, you may be in that state today. You may be a false Christian. In fact, we know from Matthew 7 that most people who claim to be Christians aren't. There's only few. Only few who are genuinely, actually, truly saved. And so friends, I warn you, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. To see if Christ Jesus be in you. And if He doesn't, turn from your hypocrisy. Look at the grace of God to bring me here to warn you today. This is the outward call of the Gospel going forth. I am standing in behalf of Christ and saying, be reconciled to God through Him. And you who are my genuine brethren, you who are genuine, true Christians, I want to admonish you with the Gospel. Be encouraged and be blessed this very day. Let your soul be filled with joy. Not, not trusting in your own righteousness to sustain you, but the righteousness of your Savior. And give God the glory, my dear brethren. Give God the glory in all things and preach this Gospel. My friends, this is the chief design and the chief end of the Gospel message and the economy of salvation. This is the end to which God works all things. It is to bring Himself glory. It is to bring Himself honor. To bring Himself exaltation. God is jealous for His own glory. So friends, whether you're a Christian or a false Christian or you're an unbeliever, look to Christ today. Look to Christ today. Give God the glory. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not saved today, believe upon Him for eternal life. And my brethren, follow Him more. Dedicate more unto Him. Render further obedience to Him. Bring God the glory. This is the end to which God works all things. I'll leave off with these words from Romans 11. Paul says, Oh, the depth of both... Excuse me. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became His counselor, or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and to Him... Or excuse me, and from, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to God be the glory through His Son, Jesus Christ. And to Christ be glory as the one true God, Savior, Lord, and King. Amen and amen.